Okay, so this is the session on needs assessment, and we want to know if you actually need them or not. Um, or rather, when and how and why do we need them? Um, a lot of credit goes to Stephanie, the lead of our um, assessment, measurement, and, and evidence working group, or the AIM working group. So we'll hopefully have an engaging session for you. I will just start by just explaining why we are having this session uh, on needs assessment. Of course, the term needs assessment itself is problematic. So we'll talk, hopefully at some point, talk about that. that what we, for lack of a better term, we're using needs assessment. Um, so we want to make sure that evidence and data are, are in our um, disposal to be able to do our work better, both for programming, so we can, we can have better informed, evidence-informed programs, but also for advocacy and fundraising, right? So sometimes, if you want to include child protection issues in a, in a policy document, they'll ask you where the evidence is. Give me the evidence and I'll include it. If you're asking for funding from, from a donor, they'll say, where is the evidence that child protection issues are actually there? Um, so for us to be able to do our work, basically we need data. Now, the big question is whether, where this data comes from. Is it from existing data that you have to analyze or is it from new data that you have to collect, or is it a mix of both? Um, so we'll start, uh, we'll start this discussion in group work, and we, we hope that you guys help us look at some of the challenges you're facing, both in terms of not having enough data, or sometimes having too much data, um, and, and then from there, decide hopefully where we want to go as a sector to be able to have better data to do what I mentioned before. Now, just to kind of give a bit of an overview of where we have been and where we have come from in terms of data, data um, production and analysis in our sector. So until about 15, 20 years ago, the data, data work in our sector has been very limited and very ad hoc. It has been agencies that were doing their own thing Many agencies in the, in the 2000s, maybe, maybe in the 90s, but mostly the 2000s, started developing their own tools to collect data in a more systematic way. And around 2010, um, so soon after the CPWG was, was set up, there were efforts to start, come together as a sector and this, decide how we want to collect data in a more systematic way and in a way that is to a certain extent, comparable across multiple, um, multiple contexts. Um, now, who knows what the first kind of interagency tool that our sector was using was developed? When was it and what was it? For our particular sector. It's the CPRA that was produced in 2010, 11. Um, and then from there, we started seeing a lot more coming. Um, there were multiple tools attached to the CPRA, some were for context where you need faster data collection, some were for context where you, you have a very small kind of area that you need to collect data. Um, and from there, we also made a lot of attempts to start um, incorporating child protection into other uh, larger kind of uh, assessment frameworks. So can someone say what the CPRA stands for? Child Protection Rapid Assessment. Now if you go to those little, um, so MIRA, who knows what MIRA is? Multi, I think it was multi-indicator rapid assessment, if I remember correctly. Then SRM, who knows what SRM is? Situation and Response Monitoring, wow. Who knows, yeah, get some chocolate. Situation and Response Monitoring. Then there was NIAF, what does NIAF stand for? 
and analysis, exactly. And, and Ron will talk to us about NIAF. What is GF? <laughs> Joint identification <laughs> and, and, and ass assessment. And then PATH. Exactly, so protection assessment framework, oh, sorry, an, an analysis framework. And then DTM, tracking, displacement tracking matrix. So all of these we have engaged with in the past, I would say 15 years. And just learning these acronyms has required a lot of effort. <laughs> um, but I'll stop, I'll stop there and I'll invite Ron to tell us a little bit after so about 2015-16, we shifted from CPRA and that kind of style of assessments to something called NIAF, and Ron will tell us a little bit about it. Thanks, Hani. So I, I was very pleased to hear that so many knew the acronym. So <laughs> that's already very good. Um, anyway, so the Child Protection uh, Needs Identification and Analysis Framework, it is a conceptual framework that is designed to, to create a common approach within um, the child protection coordination and response actors. So really working together um, on a continuous needs identification and, and data interpretation exercise. So it makes use of existing data um, using in-country sources, such as the, the UN OCHA led uh, Here's another acronym, MSNA. Multi-sectoral needs assessment, exactly. Um, it makes use of DTM, that was mentioned earlier, and um, existing official administrative data, sector-specific assessments or surveys, incident reports, etc. So it's, it's, it's also a secondary analysis tool. And the purpose of it, the purpose of the NIAF, it, it really assess, assists the, the child protection coordination groups um, in balancing the, the allocation of resources between uh, data collection, uh, needs assessment, and data analysis. So effective analysis is, as we know, is crucial for an approach, um, for an appropriate uh, response. And recognizing that humanitarian that humanitarian uh, responses often lack comprehensive data, the NIAF emphasizes the use of available data and obtainable data, both quantitative and qualitative. So this data can include numbers, images, uh, videos, audios, or field stories from, from different sources of information, uh, including official statistics, uh, monitoring visits, intersectoral assessments, interviews with children and communities, uh, local actors, and it enables the, the child protection com um, coordination groups also to, to utilize the available data, seek additional resources if you realize that there's some gaps, um, and apply also expert judgment to understand what is the child protection situation and plan the response effectively. So there's no standard minimum response or data set required for the NIAF. So it leaves a lot of flexibility and contextualization. Um, data sets and results, because data sets and results vary thus by, by context. And what remains essential in every context is a clear identification of decisions to be, to be made and the, base, the basis for those decisions and the necessary information to, to, to make them. And it's really a collaborative collaborative process between the different, different child protection actors. Now, building on the NIAF uh, and, its, and its approach, the, the global protection cluster has been working with the AORs on the protection analysis framework, or the PAF, uh, which was launched in 2021. And the PAF has been developed to guide and inform decision-making for multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary strategies that aim at reducing and preventing protection risks that may violate international human rights, refugee and international humanitarian law. Um, so while the NIAF specifically focuses on child protection risks, the PAF takes a broader view of protection, um, harmonizing information needs, questions and data from different, from different frameworks. 
Does the NIAV informs the, the, the path which are protection specific indicators and guiding questions alongside other indicators from other areas of responsibility. So gender-based violence, mine action, and HLP. Now the Global Protection Cluster and the AORs are currently developing a common methodology to streamline protection analysis and planning products uh, and processes using the, the protection analysis framework. And this, this new uh, approach, this new methodology, aims to anticipate key steps of unitary needs overviews, or HNOs, and un humanitarian response plans, or HRPs. Using the products from the, from the joint analysis, like the protection analysis updates that are being undertaken regularly, to inform the HNOs and the, and the HRPs. And this joint analysis uh, conducted throughout the year will therefore support strategic planning without adding, adding any extra burdens on, on protection and AOR members. And, and the good news is, um, because there have been some challenges in the past in terms of how do we ensure that those, those uh, paths and also the reports that it, that it generates cut across all the, all the protection areas. Um, that hasn't always been the case, and there's still some challenges with it, if you've seen some of the, of the reports that have come out recently. But we're getting better and better at it in terms of ensuring that child protection is on the, is on the agenda and that the issues are being raised within those reports, because they're very useful for, for not just for our programs, but also for, for donors to see where they may need to invest. And if child protection is not there, it gives the impression there are no child protection issues. So we keep on advocating for uh, ensuring that, that child protection is on that, uh, is on that agenda and is specifically mentioned either throughout the, the reports or in the, um, uh, as a specific recommendation or issue that's been identified. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, so we now have kind of a sense of where things have been and where they are, at least on a kind of macro tool front. But we want to turn to you um, for you guys to tell us what are the challenges you face in assessment. So um, everyone at your table, you should have pink post-it notes. If you have other color post-it notes, disregard them. But you want to find a pink post-it note and everyone is just going to take one post-it note. And we have two questions. Um, I'll go go to these first. So if you have a purple, basically this half of the room has a purple paper that says number one, you're going to answer this question. Um, what are the biggest challenges for conducting assessments in emergency contexts? If you are over here to my left, your right, and you have a number two, you're going to be answering what challenges are there in using the data collected? So you have this data, what are the challenges you face in doing something with it. Um, so you're going to take a minute, you're going to write one challenge that you face, maybe your challenges, I don't know what any of these acronyms are, I don't know uh, where to start, I don't understand it. Um, whatever it is, you're going to write one challenge down, and then you're going to share them as a table, and then you're going to try to see if there's any overlap. There's no designated facilitators at the table, because how are you to lead yourselves? Um, so write it down, share your responses, and then one person needs to report back um, a highlight in a couple minutes. <laughs> We're going to ask for a couple tables to just share a highlight or a theme from your table. So um, what we had is a, a reflection on general Resource capacity is a challenge, like in terms of resource, we mean uh, uh, lack of time, lack of money, lack of team uh, who is well prepared to talk on the different areas, like from uh, uh, accountability to affected population or to understand the, the questions, some tools, uh, or like even expertise in data triangulation, so how we read the data after. So we got this expertise, so resource capacity in general in any forms. Then we had some point on uh, long tools, like sometimes like five pages of questions for, <laughs> for a KAI. So then we have uh, uh, access that is an issue. So like you plan and then you access only like three people. So like, and 
and lack of coordination, particularly like in times of response and in rapid onset. Everybody like arrives, the first one to arrive conducts and is not coordinated and so on. So. Okay, anyone else with a highlight from question one? Why not? We had a conversation in regards to the difficulties and the invisibility in regards to the risk of child protection and the different needs assessments. And this is because many of the situations are reported like zero cases and this does not bring visibility to some of the situations that might be happening, that difficulty of coordination with the different sectors, not only for the application of the assessments themselves, but also being able to share the data and the findings after they have been applied and to bring a certain level of visibility to these results. And also, when we talk about the different questions and tools in regards to multi-sectorial approach, but there's a difficulty in regards to bringing visibility to protection issues. We have an eager one back here. Okay, if we could have a quick highlight of a common challenge you guys discussed um, in the challenge of using the data collected. Yep, back and back. If I wanted to add actually for point one, okay. We had a conversation in regards to the importance specifically when we are unaware of the existing tools. Somebody did mention it, right? It's ensuring that everyone understands the same, you know, acronyms and everything. But in an emergency, when you need to have rapid teams, you don't have enough time to do that. So I guess we need to ensure that level of comprehension in the same playing field. Information also that of secondary sources that might not be as accessible in specific territories right at the moment of the emergency. Mo human mobility dynamics, right? It's a challenge now specifically because sometimes the tools do not facilitate gathering the information that could be then used to support the decision-making process and also moving ahead and ensuring that we're consistent in what we do, meaning that sometimes the data is not reliable because of all these aspects. And it's important to have teams that are professional, that are technical, that can support us in these processes, but that are well prepared for rapid response to be able to provide that assessment in the time and the required opportunity to do it. Okay, well, I feel like you just said everything that uh, else that needed to be said. Um, so I'm gonna, <laughs> thank you. Please don't lose your um, post-it notes because we want those. Those are gonna be a piece of our data collected from this. But if I could invite the panel to come on up to the stage. Um, so we're now going to transition. You guys have identified challenges, and our panel is going to share about how they have responded to some of these challenges. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, for your reflections. We'll, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, we will collect them. Uh, so if you can just stack them in the middle of the table, we'll collect them afterwards. So I'll be posing a few questions to our uh, lovely panelists. So we have Jessica um, Stewart-Clark that many of you have met. She's the Child Protection Officer with UNHCR Division of International Protection. Then we have Maria uh, Vargas Simioki um, at Gender and Education and Emergencies Expert at ECHO. Uh, and then what was your name again? <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Van Akin, who is the, uh, your Child Protection and Emergencies uh, Technical Advisor at Plan International. Um, so I will be posing some questions to them, and they will then decide who wants to come first. This time there's going to be some democracy in there. So how do you use rapid assessments and the data produced from them? Who wants to go first? So for, within my role um, with PLAN as a technical advisor, I think this is the first time you found out what my actual job title is. Um, I work closely with my colleagues in our country offices to both ensure that needs assessments are informing our proposals. So we work together on needs assessments prior to developing proposals um, and then 
also then make sure that when we are developing those activities that they are responding to those needs um, identified. Um, I also work really closely with country level colleagues to develop and adapt methodologies for needs assessment. So, for example, those of you that joined uh, my session this morning, I was talking about doing the risk and protective factor ranking exercise that I worked closely with country colleagues to adapt as needed to uh, the local contexts. So both using them to inform programming, but then also supporting uh, how we're using those tools. Thank you very much. If you can pass on. So I read the proposals. <laughs> <laughs> So that we will discuss that later, but <laughs> yeah, so basically the, we, we get a lot of needs assessments because I think the reason I was invited to speak on this panel is because ECO is particularly difficult with needs assessments in regards to <laughs> proposals, <laughs> which we can also get into later, but yeah, definitely my thing is I read the proposals. We didn't want to say that, but you said it. <laughs> um, personally, I don't love a rapid assessment. I don't really love them because they are such a proliferation of endless assessments everywhere. So in terms of um, how do I use them, I don't in my current uh, <laughs> role, but only because I'm not in the field. Um, but in my interest is more in the how the data that is produced from these assessments and not just rapid assessments, but everything assessed uh, about how that's used. And just on that is what we realize, it's not being used very well. We're not using the sheer volume of information that we collect in all these assessments. Great, thank you. So maybe you keep the, keep the mic and I'll ask the second question. So which is, what is a one challenge that you can <coughs> common, you, that you commonly notice in data collection or analysis? I think you kind of answered it, but. Yeah, I mean, it, I think, not to sound like a broken record, but the issue really is, is that we have a whopping amount of data that is sitting in a lot of dusty corners of our shared drives and laptops and notebooks and wherever it is. And we don't capitalize upon that data. So not only do we drive ourselves mad by going and rushing to do assessments and a new assessment, and now we have this echo proposal, so we're gonna to have to do a new assessment and like all this kind of stuff, constantly reinventing, reassessing, doing everything in a mad rush when actually we could take more time to be more thoughtful and more intentional about what is the information we don't have? What do we not know? Who have we not spoken to? Who is not visible in this data? Because often the people with the loudest voices are not the most vulnerable. We don't hear about the people who may have hidden needs or more specificities because we're in such a rush quite frankly. So I think the challenge that I really want to highlight um, is around take not finding and not making. We actually need to take the time. And we do need to push back at requests for new assessments and new information and really take time to actually look at what we do know and figure out what we don't. And then let's focus on that. Because also we are boring the refugees, asylum seekers, and other populations to tears by going in and asking everyone to tell us the worst thing that has ever happened over and over and over again. Um, gosh, I really could go on, couldn't I? Okay, please, Maria. Oh, sure, I'm happy to. Um, I, I mean, I think basically we're in violent agreement on that point. Um, which I had a feeling that we would be. Um, you know, our assessments can lack a clear scope or objective. We're, we are, you know, either relying on needs assessments that are outdated or we're rushing to put together needs assessments in, front, in response to a proposal. Um, and it means we're not necessarily taking the time to do a desk review, to consider what's the data we already have, what have we already learned, what are we aware of, and what do we actually need to know. But what I really, um, I actually had three challenges that I was gonna go through, but uh, for the sake of time, and also not to repeat some of the discussions we've already had, I kind of wanted to pick up on what you were saying about not actually talking to the quieter voices. Um, we're not always engaging children and adolescents meaningfully in our assessments. Yes, we, we strive to include them in focus group discussions. We strive to do community mappings. We, try, we strive to work with them. 
but are we actually including them in the design and planning of an assessment? Are we actually co-leading assessments with adolescents? And are we actually then involving them in the analyze, analyzing, the, I would say the analyzation of needs, a new word, uh, in the next uh, Webster's Dictionary, um, but in the analysis of needs, and then in the design of programming that is meant to be targeting them. What we have seen is that adolescents aren't always systematically included in HRPs, in HNOs. They're not included in our planning. And so there is a serious gap and a challenge there in terms of, of, you know, how are we doing this? And I think that it's done with the best intentions. We don't necessarily know or feel confident meaningfully engaging with children and adolescents always. I think there's a hesitancy there. We're afraid to do additional harm. But that also means that we're therefore actually not including the people most impacted by our program and who we're most seeking to work with in gathering the data that is about them. Um, so I'd say that is, a, that is a huge challenge that we face. Okay. Thank you very much. Now from a donor yeah, no. who <laughs> always asks for assessment, what is your like, I know, I'm sorry, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, I, I, the problem is, I think, and I agree with both of you, um, I think there is a lot of data out there and I think often not we, I, I'm, I'm just looking upwards because I'm, I'm looking at the single form in my head and there's like <laughs> one section where it says, what needs assessments have you conducted to inform this proposal? Um, and I think that the problem that we have, and I think it's, it's kind of complementing a bit what you're both saying, is that then because of this necessity to have a needs assessment specific for a proposal, we end up with very generic needs assessments that actually don't look at the most significant child protection needs. Um, so these invisible children, uh, the children we're not seeing, they don't, they don't get seen. Um, our general needs assessments, um, I don't know if you know this, but <laughs> it's a fun fact. Um, Legally speaking, only what's on the single form is, is the legally binding part. So anything you annex, we, we take it into account, but it's not the legal part of the contract. So the needs assessment part that is important has to go inside the single form. In the single form, we have descriptions that say, in Colombia for the past 55 years, we have had armed conflict. Thank you. That is not helpful. So I really, I really like, I know that we're forcing you to do needs assessments that then you have to attach to, to like the documents or you have to reference. I have two points on that. One is I think your organizations need to lo lobby a bit more with donors about some of these issues. Uh, also co collectively perhaps would be good. And the second one is do not waste the little space that you have where the donor, the part that the donor has to read because we do not have to read everything you submit with in Colombia for the past 55 years, we have had armed conflict. Like really like make it to the point of what is important for us to know about the specific needs and, and because otherwise it's, it's just generic text. Right. Thank you. That's a very good tip for everyone. Um, so what I'm hearing so far is that we're not looking at what we have before we <laughs> launch into launch into actually collecting new data. Sometimes it's because a donor is asking for it, but sometimes it's because we're actually not looking at the data. Now, the interesting thing is if you go back to the tools that were developed 15 years ago for the sector, they say the same thing. You go through, there's, a, there's an entire flow chart that walks you through all the tools. Over and over, the flow chart says, do a desk review, look at the data that you have, secondary data review. It's just probably repeated more than any other sentence in that flow chart before you actually get to collect data. And there is an entire process that was initiated then that a lot of you guys still use, and that's this concept of what, what do we need to know? Right, the analysis of what is it that we actually need to know so that we don't end up collecting data that we don't need or da data that already exists, right? So I think there is agreement on that and it has existed since 15 years ago when our sector kind of really started engaging in this. But there still seems to be, and part of the reason this session actually came together, is that organizations are struggling to have the data that they need to be able to program. So sometimes they're not looking at the right place, but sometimes 
and I have many examples to give you, it's a new emergency or it's a new phase of an emergency. So a lot of, a lot of the data that we, we need doesn't exist, that needs to be produced, and that's when people get stuck. Like, what do we do? What do we use now? So I'll come to the last question with that. What is, what is the promising approach? But you can also address what I said in answering that. Sorry. Itching. Somebody is itching. <laughs> Honey, I just, I think this is something that I really, I think that's why I was so excited about this. We have so much data on child protection, on child protection risks. We also really, we, we know what will happen in emergencies. This is not to abandon a contextualized, uh, you know, a nuanced understanding of the context or what, uh, what is really happening on the ground. That you do need and, and you must and you will. But in the midst of a rapid onset emergency, having the partners like sprinting around everybody and their cousin doing needs assessments and rapid assessments because everyone is trying to get the information it's impossible to coordinate at that point you don't even know who's on the ground you don't even know who's going to stick around you're being told by your donor and i say this as well self-reflexively as you and hcr donor and service provider right like we do the same thing just saying so we are saying, no, you got to get, you got to, you know, what's going on in this context, you want to know. But we have data on highly predictable risks for forcibly displaced children. We know what the risks are. And it, of course, it's a generalization. And there might be things that are very specific to this context. But we don't necessarily need a brand spanking new assessment to put this together in the midst of a rapid onset. We can capitalize on what we do know and then say, hang on, these are the things we don't know. Let's focus on that. So, OK, in the next two weeks, we just need to know this specific thing about this area or this group of people. How can we do that together? But I think we spend, I think we are almost like comfortable in the chaos of it, of the, of the assessments-ness. We are like comfortable in that chaos because we know it. And because as child protection practitioners, we are so used to like rising to the challenge and like, you know, whatever the size of the tank is, we'll grow to it. So when we are told to do a rapid assessment with all these partners across eight locations in the next 24 hours, you don't have many child protection partners saying, that's insane, no. Everyone says, Yes, okay, hang on, send the teams out, pull them from case management, pull them from the child friendly spaces and send them out to do this multi sectoral needs assessment. And I think this is this like we we need to stick up for ourselves a bit and actually say, no, hang on, can I give you the data that we have? For example, shameless punting from the UNHCR child protection data analysis. Any one of you could pull from that data to say to UNHCR. We don't need to do a needs assessment at this moment. We can tell you from your data analysis that you published, here are the predictable risks for forcibly displaced and stateless children. And this is what we're operating on as a presumption as we enter this emergency. And then we will collect more nuanced contextual data. So I'm going to play devil's advocate and I'll invite everyone else to. Um, so I, I think as a, as a vision, what you're painting, I couldn't agree with it more that we don't it should not be an automatic reflex of collecting data now i can bring many examples of donors policymakers who have refused to include children or child protection issues in their funding in their in their very impactful advocacy or, or policy documents because we can't give them the data right so how do we deal with that reality of our sector being chronically underfunded and some donors will tell you we just don't have you don't present to us what we need to be able to do compared to nutrition immediately goes into an assessment right produces data puts it out there it's a much easier job for nutrition than it is for us so how do we deal I'm, with that i'm hearing you honey i hear you i hear both of you because i agree one of one of the key challenges i <laughs> 
a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. But one of the key challenges that you know we did here was that we have all this data, but we don't, we're not doing the desk review. And so what Jessica is you know proposing is a solution to that part. We have so much data, let's use it, let's analyze that to inform immediate needs, which will then let us know what are our gaps, what are we missing, and what did I mention as one of our gaps and our challenges engaging adolescents. And so actually, Plan has been doing a lot of work at looking at how do we involve adolescents in our needs assessments in planning and designing programming. So I'm going to now do some shameless pump team. Um, I learned from the best. Uh, Plan's adolescent programming toolkit has a wealth of resources that support engaging adolescents in assessments, in designing program, and even challenges, uh, you know, even uh, addresses a lack of uh, our lack of a uh, you know, scope and objectives. The toolkit offers an analytical framework, honey, tailored to what we need to know. What is the information we're missing? So in a sudden onset emergency, what do we immediately need to know? And it also specifically focuses on adolescence um, and it includes tools that are tailored to be able to be used with and by adolescents. And it has a very, very strong focus on adolescent girls as a key at-risk group. It's really intentional about empowering adolescents and girls and places them at the center of the assessment process through tools specifically designed for them. Um, and where appropriate and possible, we actually have adolescent girls lead the assessment process and lead the design process for programming. So we've actually used this. Um, I'm going to, you know, skim through some of my examples for the sake of time and being mindful of everyone, but we use the toolkit for needs assessments in 10 countries. And each time it has resulted in better visibility of adolescents who are an otherwise regularly overlooked and invisible segment of, a, of the affected population. And we received good feedback from the adolescents and the girls themselves about, and from their families, about the importance of consulting directly with them. For some of the adolescent girls we worked with, this was the first time they had actually been directly consulted in programming that impacts them. They had never participated in a humanitarian action previously at the community level. Um, and it just shows like what is possible if we proactively engage adolescents in assessing and analyzing needs and designing responses, because they also supported the design of multi-sectoral programs that responded to their needs and allowed them to have a voice. So yeah, I mean, I completely agree. We, we have a lot of data. There is still a need to collect new data. Our, the context we work in change rapidly, but we need to be more targeted and more strategic in how we're doing that. There we have it. We have the answer. Maria, uh, uh, help us wrap this segment up because we have another exercise to do. So, so I'm, yeah, I, I was going to say something else. <laughs> so now I have reconsidered uh, my response. Um, no, I, I want to, to draw just a link to GBV. Do you know that in GBV, the, the fight for the past, I don't know how many years has been the fact that we do not need reports of GBV to know that GBV is ongoing in a humanitarian emergency, right? And this has been the advocacy that has been done. I have to admit, my, not all my colleagues get it all the time, but it yet it's an advocacy <laughs> that, that has trickled through. And I think this has helped this kind of notion. So you don't ask for a GBV assessment. You assume there is GBV ongoing and we will do service provision, whether it's health, whether it's case management, whether it's, I mean, the basic kind of GBV service provision. I think you need to reconsider a little bit, going back to what you're saying. What are the predicted, what are the predicted three, top three things which you are 99% likely to see and start educating on that and say, okay, in a humanitarian crisis of this nature, we are likely to see this, this, and this. We will get the data to you, but right now we're going to start programming first. So, so tying it a little bit on that whole no regrets policy that the UN has been pushing for the past few years. Um, it's also the fact that you cannot wait for the assessment to happen, you know, to, to kind of get to the point. And let's be honest, 
the child protection people are not the fastest. It's normally the last assessments we see. No, ma'am, I'm sorry, but uh, WFP is out there in two seconds. They have out the, <laughs> the food needs and potentially a nutrition one. And then four weeks later or, or three months later, you're getting a child protection needs assessment. And that's why also the immediate funding is not going to that. So because you cannot have the rapid rapidness that other sectors have, then try to play to something else. Find a way that you can use data you already have to start educating on that and to give you that time to then be able to come up with the invisible voices, to do your assessment properly, to consult people, to not re-traumatize, etc. So it's kind of like a bridging solution, what I'm proposing. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. That was a very good wrap up. Uh, so what I take from the panel is we try, we need to look at what we have first before we start collecting data. We need to engage those that are most affected and they have the right to be part of the, the programming and that includes assessments. Um, and we need to advocate for the no regrets basis programming, at least in the early phases of emergencies, which by the way, we have been doing for years. It just hasn't worked yet, but we, have, we need to learn from GBV colleagues how, how to do it. With that, I'll hand back over and thank you guys very much for a very insightful discussion. Okay, so I was told I was supposed to stand in the middle. Um, we started with challenges. We've now heard from our panelists about some of the ways that they're doing, um, kind of addressing those. We want you to turn back to your tables and actually if I could get a few people to help me pass out um, some yellow and green post-it notes, um, if someone could help pass these around. Um, uh, so you're gonna take these ones and we'd like you to, again on your table, write down what do you need to help, or what do you think the field needs to help move us forward to address the, the, the challenges that were raised here? What would be helpful if you think about um, in two years time that we're back, what would help the field move forward in um, conducting assessments in, or not conducting assessments in, but having robust data to inform programs or to make needs. So we want you to identify what is it um, that is needed? What is it that, is, um, that would help move things forward? Okay, so please keep writing. Don't, let, don't, don't stop writing, but I, have, I would like to ask if anyone wants to share what they have written, what they think is needed in one sentence, though not in a long expose. Does anyone want to share what they think is needed? Um, I think building on uh, what has been discussed just now, uh, maybe what we need is not new tools or new assessment, it's more um, broader global analysis of what in this kind of context we need is happening and we, we know it's happening. So you know, so it's, a, it's a bit like uh, all the investment we're doing on uh, the impact on uh, on some programming, sometimes we're spending so much money to, to try to find out what is happening, while in fact, if we were investing audio, instead of investing $50,000 a year, $15,000 a year, it would be much better to have a, a global alliance analysis of you know, uh, context that say, in this kind of context, we know that this and this and this and this is happening. So like that, we can go back to ECHO and say, you know, based on that evidence, we know that. So ju just to say that, uh, I mean, we know that there are many, uh, I think building on the discussion, it's maybe not what we need, extra tools we need to know, it's uh, to, to have it's more the advocacy uh, elements that uh, we would require. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the same way, it's funny because two days ago I was talking to a donor and I was talking about risk and they say we don't fund, uh, we don't fund prevention but it's just child protection risk so it's basically our, our job but they still think it's prevention and not life saving. So I think there's definitely uh, some more push for centrality of child protection that we need to do in every single program. That's definitely uh, something where we need to work jointly and uh, also have a strong uh, education of donors, but also other sectors. 
and uh, for working in integration as an integrated uh, programming i think there's a lot of work that we need to do there and have also be open to other sector and see there also uh, just not focus within ourselves but look also at others and how we can be beneficial to other sectors um I mean, I'm not sure it entirely answers the questions, but following up on what Jan was saying is, I think we have a lot of data out there already. And I think there's very, for me, the word needs assessment is a little bit limiting because it's very specific to a moment in time and the needs in that moment in time. But I think we collect data regularly. We don't necessarily analyze it. So kind of tooting my own horn, but the CPIMS research where, you know, in the CPIMS, we have over a million cases. Now we're only looking at 90,000, but that gives us huge, huge, um, um, that gives us, um, how do you say, a huge argument or a huge, you know, um, kind of positioning on what, you know, children who are receiving case management, you know, what their risks are and so on. And so I think in general that, but all the other IM systems that exist, being able to use them regularly and not just when there's a rapid onset, but regularly and being able to use that data, which then could inform a rapid onset in a specific location or just general research, I think would be a possible way forward. Yeah, no, there have a few points as well. I think um, how to analyze data, and it's not just like here is like X number of children or of this uh, protection issue, but if you like cross analyze with like gender, age, locations, like all kinds of other factors that can really refine the information so that we can say, okay, in this location, we see like this particular problem linked to these other vulnerabilities, and that helps us to target much better our intervention. Um, also, we need methodology, I think, or it's, I don't know if it's really methodology, it's more like maybe just education on how do we translate this data into program. I see too many times we analyze something really well, and then we keep doing the same thing, not just learning from that data and adapting it to, to the needs that children just told us. And I have plenty of examples on case by on a CAFAG with this. And the last point is, um, I was thinking, can we have like a kind of library where all the assessment of a country will be uh, stored? And then even if there is like rotation and turnover of staff, like people know where to look for the, the, the assessment that was done last year. I was in a situation just recently of explaining to a country team from UNICEF, like the training and all the, the needs assessment that was done last year on CAFAG, and then sending them all the tools and everything. And she was like, oh, wow, amazing. <laughs> and yeah, so like, I think having a place where all of this is stored and people know where to access it. Can I ask a question to Ron? Ron, we, we used to do desk reviews, country specific desk reviews, and which refers, actually, your question reminded me of like having everything in one place. We would collect everything and then do a desk review, almost synthesizing what is there and then producing it exactly for that reason. I don't know if it's still ongoing or is it now under the NIAF framework? Or? Yeah, no, we're do not doing that anymore, but it fits under the NIA framework. And um, there is um, the OCHA website, which has by country, you can find all the information that's at least the public public work. We're currently, as the CPR, currently working on, on something uh, using AI to, to see how we can, we can tap into all those public resources that exist related to child protection and bring that together in country sort of country profiles it's a lot of work it's uh, it's also trying to how do you deal with some of the issues that are sensitive even though they're in public documents but when ai brings it all together in one document it may stand out so we have to have to look at some filters that we may need to use but the idea is to to uh, to continue to work on it and hopefully we have something uh, in the second half of the year that we could uh, that we could share but that's that's what the country sort of country information country profiles okay. um 
Thank you, everyone. Um, before Hani concludes with some things, I want to highlight a few things. Can you okay. click to the end? So first of all, there is chocolate on your table. And if you haven't eaten it, please do, because I'm not bringing it home with me. Um, so we, the members of the AME Working Group, I should have probably started with that. I'm Stephanie. I help co-lead the AME Working Group. Um, I'm from UNICEF and Achenti. Um, so the members of our group started compiling resources that they have found helpful. Um, it's probably not in good form of me to lead the AME group and just say this is just like a compiled list of member resources. There's not like a methodology to how this was compiled. That was the methodology that people said, I found this helpful. And so it was on the list. Um, you'll notice that the, you don't know what the hyperlink is. Um, it's somewhat intentional, but if you, um, use this QR code and sign up for our mailing list, or you have written your email downstairs, we will send you the list. If you have a resource that you have found helpful, we will add it to the list kind of just to, if there's information out there, we want to help share it, even if it is in a simple document, if that would just help you know to have some things. So if you have a resource, send it to us. We'll put it on the list. Um, if you want an electronic copy of this, um, sign up for our mailing list. Right, thank you. Just uh, I wanted to make one kind of methodological observation for those of you who, who do have research background. We have to be careful not to while completely agree that we have to analyze um, ad administrative data, which CPIMS, for example, falls into that category of administrative data, which is based on individual cases, we should not confuse that with population level data. Population level data gives us a different kind of view of the issues, whereas, and the depth that CPIMS data, for example, can give us is, is huge, and we are not taking advantage of it. But in terms of the breadth and in terms of the, the issues that are for those that, are, that fall outside of the actually, a lot of the time, the most vulnerable do not get captured in a lot of the administrative type of, type of data. So I think we got quite a bit of uh, input from all of you guys. So we'll, it's, it's up to us to kind of bring it all together. Yeah, and you can help us bring that together. So if, um, if you could take your sticky notes that you had and as you leave, there are three flip charts in the back. Uh, one is training and technical assistance, one is tools and resources, one is other. If you could categorize where you think your challenges fall or where you think your tools fall, to the best of your ability, if you don't want to do that and you want to leave your stickies on the table, I will do it for you. Um, but if you don't have great handwriting, if you could stick them to where you think they should go, um, this will help us kind of make sense of what was said here and what we could do as an AME working group to help support you in um, doing your rapid or needs assessment or data analysis um, or secondary data review. Um, we are, it is time now for a coffee break. So, um, and then the next session is at 3.30. So put your stickies in the best category you think they should go, take chocolate on your way out and sign up for our mailing list if you wanna get a copy of the resource list.